...started with grooming behavior among primates. While humans are relatively hairless, most other primates have thick fur all over their bodies. When left unchecked, this fur quickly becomes matted with dirt and debris. It also makes an attractive home for fleas, lice, ticks, and other parasites. As a result, primate fur needs periodic grooming to stay clean. Individual primates can and do groom themselves, but they can only effectively groom about half their bodies. They can't easily groom their own backs, faces, and heads. So to keep their entire bodies clean, they need a little help from their friends. This is called social grooming. Picture two male chimpanzees engaged in an act of social grooming. One chimp, the groomee, sits hunched over, exposing his full backside. The other chimp, the groomer, crawls up and begins examining the first chimp's fur. He'll typically spend a few minutes scratching and picking at it with his fingers, using his opposable thumbs to pull out bits of stray matter. It's a purposeful activity that requires a good deal of attention and focus. If we could somehow ask the grooming chimp what he's doing, he might give a pragmatic explanation. I'm trying to remove these bits and pieces from my friend's back. That's the purpose of the activity and what his attention is focused on. He might also cite the logic of straightforward reciprocity. If I groom my friend's back, he's more likely to groom mine in return. Which is true. Chimps form mutual grooming partnerships that are relatively stable over the course of their lives. At first blush, then, social grooming seems like an act of hygiene, a way to keep one's fur clean. This is far from the complete picture, however. We can't take social grooming at face value. There are some puzzling facts that cast doubt on the simple hygienic function. Most primates spend far more time grooming each other than necessary for keeping their fur clean. Gelada baboons, for example, devote a whopping 17% of their daylight hours to grooming each other. Clearly, this is overkill, as some primate species spend only one-tenth of a percent of their time grooming each other, while birds spend maybe one-hundredth percent of their time on similar preening behaviors. Even more puzzling is the fact that primates spend a lot more time grooming each other than they spend grooming themselves. If the only purpose of grooming were hygiene, we'd expect to see more self-grooming in proportion to social grooming. Finally, we can correlate the average body size of each primate species with the amount of time they spend grooming. If grooming were strictly a hygienic activity, we'd expect larger species, those with more fur, to spend more time grooming each other. But in fact, there's no correlation. We might ask ourselves, what's going on here? There must be some other function at play. The primatologist Robin Dunbar has spent much of his career studying social grooming, and his conclusion has since become the consensus among primatologists. Social grooming, he says, isn't just about hygiene. It's also about politics. By grooming each other, primates help forge alliances that help them in other situations. An act of grooming conveys a number of related messages. The groomer says, I'm willing to use my spare time to help you, while the groomee says, I'm comfortable enough to let you approach me from behind or touch my face. Meanwhile, both parties strengthen their alliance merely by spending pleasant time in close proximity. Two rivals, however, would find it hard to let their guards down to enjoy such a relaxed activity. The bottom line? Grooming, says Dunbar, creates a platform off which trust can be built. This political function of grooming helps explain other data points that don't make sense according to the strictly hygienic function. For example, it explains why higher-ranked individuals receive more grooming than lower-ranked individuals. When low-ranking primates choose to groom one of their superiors, they're less likely to be groomed in return, so they must be angling for some other kind of benefit rather than simple reciprocity. Indeed, grooming partners are more likely to share food, tolerate each other at feeding sites, and support each other during confrontations with other members of the group. The political function of grooming also explains why grooming time across species is correlated with the size of the social group, but not the amount of fur. Larger groups have, on average, greater political complexity, making alliances more important but also harder to maintain. Note that these primates don't need to be conscious of their political motivations. As far as natural selection is concerned, all that matters is that the primates who do more social grooming fare better than primates who do less. Primates are thereby endowed with instincts that make them feel good when they groom each other.
without necessarily under good.